Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the invitation to present some of my work on um, the Australian stinging trees. Um, for a start, I would like to thank Sofian for the invitation to speak today. And also, of course, um, because without the Q patch, none of this work would have um, probably been possible. So just as a bit of uh, background, um, I work at the Institute for Molecular Bioscience at the University of Queensland in Brisbane, Australia, and my research group is interested in studying venoms. Uh, the reason we're interested in venoms is because um, toxins have evolved many times in numerous species uh, and they have evolved to modulate neuronal function and to disrupt electrical activity or chemical messenger signaling. In, in prey or predators. And in particular, many toxins display high affinity and selectivity for uh, neuronal ion channels. Uh, and so we can use these as, as probes to understand ion channel function. And in um, my group, we're particularly interested in, in pain mechanisms and pain pathways and ion channels involved in those mechanisms. So the official definition of a venom is a secretion containing one or more toxins produced by an animal and typically injected into prey or aggressors by biting or stinging. But hopefully at the end of today's talk, I'll have convinced you that there are also venomous plants. Uh, so there's actually several plants in particular from the nettle family that have evolved stinging hairs that inject secretions for defense. And one really well-known member of this family is the common European stinging nettle, which um, I'm sure many of you um, know when you touch it, it causes um, pain. Uh, in Australia, we've also got a, a number of members of the um, nettle family and they belong to the genus of dendronide. Uh, of course, because we're in Australia, we do everything venomous bigger and better than the rest of the world. Um, and so the Australian stinging plants um, have a reputation for being particularly uh, painful. They're called commonly the Gimpy Gimpy tree or the Gimpy Gimpy bush in reference to um, the town of Gimpy where they're fa found. Um, and the two species that I want to talk to you about today is um, uh, the giant Australian stinging tree or Dendronite excelsa. Um, which you can see on the left here. Um, so this is really truly an oversized nettle. The giant Australian stinging tree can grow up to 30 meters tall. Uh, and most of the time, obviously, you won't be coming in contact with leaves of this tree unless you go, for example, for a bushwalk um, and you brush past um, what's colloquially known as an ankle biter. Uh, the other species is the mulberry leafed stinger uh, or Dendronite moroides, and this is also colloquially known as the suicide plant. Um, and on the right here, you can see that it's generally a smaller specimen. And this one in particular is um, in my front garden where I've strategically located it as a burglar deterrent, or some people would say um, entrapment. Uh, when you look closely at the leaves and the stems of dendronite, you can see that they're covered with this fuzzy fur-like looking um, hairs, and these are actually called uh, trichomes. And in the middle, in a close-up, you can see that these trichomes or silica stinging hairs are filled with um, a, a fluid. Um, and on the right-hand side in the electron microscope image, you can hopefully appreciate that um, these stinging hairs are certainly sharp enough to penetrate your skin. Um, and when they do, usually the very tip of the stinging hair breaks off and um, you essentially have injection of uh, this mixture of bioactive molecules or what you could possibly consider, consider a venom. Now, the sting of the gimpy gimpy plant has uh, been called the worst ca uh, kind of pain you can imagine, like being burnt with hot acid and electrocuted at the same time. I'm not quite sure that um, I would agree with that particular assessment, but it's certainly severe enough to warrant um, erection of warning signs. So, for example, on the right hand side, you can see a uh, warning sign found in far north Queensland in Cairns, where uh, the council is warning visitors to be uh, aware of the presence of stinging trees and if they are stung to call um, for medical help. Now, what are the symptoms of the gimpy gimpy stings? So pretty much similar to the European stinging nettles, contact of the trichomes with skin causes an almost immediate pricking and stinging um, sensation. Um, a little bit of um, 
itching and also you can see piloerection. So on the bottom here, you can actually see a picture of my arm where I had an unfortunate gardening accident. Um, and you can appreciate that sort of in, uh, within a minute of being stung, um, there's just a little bit of um, a piloerection vis visible. And then over several minutes, you get development of a wheel. And so this is probably the reaction um, elicited by injection of uh, histamine. Um, and so similar to what you would expect from a bee, bee sting. Um, and then more slowly you get development of an axon reflex flare. Um, so this is um, activation of peripheral nerve endings and um, a local vasodilatory response. Um, and on the far right hand side, you can also appreciate um, in the image taken with a thermal camera that this um, local vasodilation and the local effects persists for quite some time. Uh, so my estimate would be that the sting that, or the pain from a sting lasts for at least six to eight hours, uh, much more likely days. Um, and the really interesting thing about gimpy gimpy stings is, is that you can have um, re-emergence of sort of intense pricking, burning, crawling and shooting sensations for actually weeks um, after you've been stung. And so this is one of the reasons why I became interested in um, the gimpy gimpy plant. So the question, of course, was um, what causes pain after the gimpy gimpy stings? And it's pre pretty well known for uh, quite a long time, actually, that both European nettles and the gimpy gimpy trichomes uh, contain small molecule neurotransmitters, in particular acetylcholine, um, 5-hydroxytryptamine or um, serotonin, and also uh, histamine. Um, so on the bottom here, you can see um, that um, quantification of acetylcholine, 5-HT and histamine content in the um, dendronite excelsa leaves shows that you can find these um, small molecules in the trichomes, um, but not in the leaf without the trichomes. And, and we can certainly not detect um, either of those um, in the extract of um, uh, you know, distantly related plants like Petunia or Nicotania. Now, the problem with um, these small molecules is that it's been known since about 1957 from human studies that the dialyzed extract uh, of the gimpy gimpy uh, stinging uh, hairs that lack uh, these neurotransmitters still causes pain. And in fact, injection of simulated mixtures of these don't recapitulate the symptoms. So really that suggests that there's something else contained in the gimpy gimpy stinging hairs that causes pain. So the approach we took to try and identify what some of these unknown components might be was to use um, activity guided fractionation. Uh, so we fractionated the stinging hair extract using high performance liquid chromatography and then we used a reasonably crude in vivo assay where we injected each of these fractions um, in vivo by a, a shallow intraplantar injection in mice. So that's a, a subcutaneous injection into the, into the foot pad. And then we quantified um, pain-like behaviors in response to injection of these fractions. And we found that um, surprisingly, although the secretion from the gimpy gimpy plant is actually quite complex, as you can see on the right, there was only one fraction that caused any pain-like behaviors in mice. And this was um, quite a, a late eluting fraction, um, so quite hydrophobic, and it was dominated by um, molecules in roughly the four kilodalton um, molecular weight range, so uh, small peptides most likely. Uh, so we then used triptych, triptych digest followed by MSMS mass spectrometry and transcriptomic analysis, and we identified a new family of peptides um, consisting of 36 amino acid residues and three disulfide bonds in the bioactive fraction. And we termed these peptides uh, the gimpy ties um, as they come from the gimpy gimpy tree. Um, and for peptides that are derived from dendronite excelsa, we uh, named, the, named these um, with a prefix EXTX for excelsa toxin. And for peptides derived from dendronite moroides, we termed these um, mo moroidotoxins with a prefix of motox. Now, the interesting thing about these gimpetides is that the primary amino acid sequence of these peptides has absolutely no similarity to known peptides. Um, in fact, they're only um, sort of 
loosely related to albumin derived plant peptides. But the interesting thing was that the cysteine spacing um, is similar to animal derived cysteine, not venom peptides. Um, so inhibitory cysteine knots uh, is a protein structural motif that essentially consists of three disulfide bonds. So you've got two disulfide bonds that form a loop and the third disulfide bond sort of dives through the middle of these and forms um, a, a very tight uh, molecular knot. And this motif is quite commonly found in peptides from um, animal venoms. So for example, spider venoms, scorpion venoms, and also cone snail venoms. So we were a little bit surprised that we found a similar structure motif um, in the stinging hairs of the, uh, the gimpy gimpy tree. We next look at the um, NMR structure of um, excelsitoxin A, um, and we found that as predicted from the um, primary sequence and the disulfide spacing, the 3D fold of the gimpied hides actually seems to be quite similar to um, neurotoxins found in spiders and cone snails. So on the right here, you've got Huan toxin 4, um, which is actually a voltage gated sodium channel modulator from the venom of. Um, uh, of a spider and you can appreciate so in yellow are, are the um, disulfide bonds and you can appreciate that uh, the overall structure of excelsitoxin and in particular the placement of the disulfide bonds and also the orientation of the loops actually was quite similar um, so although this, the primary sequence is very different from the spider venom peptides the 3d fold seems to be very similar um, we also looked at where in the um, leaves these venom derived or plant venom derived peptides are produced and using moldy imaging we saw that the masses corresponding to excelsitoxin uh, were um, mostly present in the the trichomes and also trichome support cells but not the the rest of the leaves so this really supported a putative neurotoxic activity uh, of these gimpetides and possibly a role in um, causing pain after gimpy gimpy stings. Of course there's one way to definitively prove the bioactivity of these peptides and that's to chemically synthesize them. Um, so um, my collaborator uh, Dr. Tom Durek at the University of Queensland um, produced these peptides by FMOX solid phase peptide synthesis and on the bottom here you can see that synthetic um, excelsitoxin shown on the top trace uh, really eludes very nicely with the crude material isolated from the stinging hairs and so we were quite confident that we'd actually produced the correct material. To determine whether or not these peptides really are um, bioactive we returned to our in vivo assay and so this time we uh, injected synthetic excelsitoxin and also motoxin um, by intraplantar injection in mice and you can see on the left here that both excelsitoxin, so in the blue and the green, and also motoxin in the orange caused dose-dependent um, pain-like behaviours after injection into the foot pad. And on the right-hand side, you can also see that um, local injection of excelsitoxin causes local vasodilation. So this was reflected by um, a significant increase in the pore temperature in the injected pore, but not in the uninjected pore. Um, and really, this was quite consistent with uh, the sort of symptoms you see in humans um, after a sting. Uh, so we next wanted to see whether the gimpy tides um, might directly activate peripheral nerve excitability and we did that by using the skin saphenous nerve preparation. Uh, so in case you're not familiar with this technique, essentially you dissect the uh, skin of the hind paw of a mouse with the saphenous nerve attached. Um, you can then um, tease individual nerve fibers from the saphenous nerve, place it on a recording electrode and then in this preparation you can expose the receptive field um, of these nerve fibers in the skin to for example um, chemicals like the excelsitoxins uh, or also um, thermal or mechanical stimuli and you can then record propagated action potentials. Uh, so when we did that, we found that application of excelsitoxin to the receptive field of 
um, C and A fibers causes spontaneous action potential discharge. So on the bottom here, you can see uh, sample recordings from a myelinated A fiber and also an unmyelinated C fiber. Um, and each of these um, dots is actually an action potential that's plotted as instantaneous frequency. So the higher on the y-axis, um, the more rapid the firing. Um, and you can see that um, although you start with a fiber that's essentially quiescent, after application of excelsitoxin, you get very um, profound um, action potential discharge in, in both fiber types. And when we quantified this across a number of fibers, we found that essentially all of the um, nociceptive C fibers respond to excelsitoxin, and also the vast majority of A fibers responded with action potential firing. So to look a bit further into the pharmacology of these peptides, we next turned to um, calcium imaging in dissociated dorsal root ganglion neurons. Um, and what we found here, so you can see um, in the top panel here, the um, fields of view in uh, dissociated dorsal root ganglion neurons loaded with calcium dye. Uh, we found that um, application of excelsitoxin caused calcium influx in um, neurons of all sizes, um, although non-neuronal cells were uh, not activated. So um, in, in the white, you've got um, neurons that responded to application of excelsitoxin and in the red you've got highlighted neuro, um, cells that did not respond to excelsitoxin. Now the response profile of the excelsitoxin sensitive um, neurons um, overlap partially with capsaicin sensitive neurons and again this was consistent with our observation that both C and A fibers respond to excelsitoxin. But perhaps the most interesting observation was that the excelsitoxin induced calcium responses um, could almost uh, completely be reversed by uh, the sodium channel blocker tetrodotoxin. So this suggested that perhaps the gimpitides might act at neuronal voltage gated sodium channels. So to explore this in a little bit more detail, we um, performed um, patch clamp recordings and dissociated dorsal root ganglion neurons. And here we found that excelsitoxin um, inhibited the inactivation of a voltage-gated inward current. So um, on the left side, you've got um, in, in the black the um, control current, and in the green, you've got the current in the present, presence of excelsitoxin. Um, and we um, in particular noted a, a significantly increased persistent current that we observed in, in every neuron that we patched. And importantly, um, this current was abolished by replacement of external sodium with choline and also by tetrodotoxin, suggesting that this really was a um, voltage-gated sodium channel effect. Uh, so to probe the pharmacology of the gimpitides in more details, we next turned to um, automated patch clamp electrophysiology using the Q-patch, uh, and we used TE671 neuroblastoma cells to do this. And so in these cells, we found that both um, excelsitoxin, which you can see on the left, and also um, motoxin in the middle here, uh, inhibit inactivation of this endogenous uh, voltage-gated sodium current. And um, on the right-hand side, I've got the effect of a scorpion venom um, on voltage-gated sodium channels in comparison so that you can appreciate that really the pharmacological effect of these plant peptides um, is quite similar to um, some of the animal venoms. And so uh, this, this seems to be a remarkable case of convergent evolution where you've got a plant evolving a similar pharmacology to um, a, a scorpion venom. Um, in more detailed uh, mechanism of action studies, we also found that both excelsitoxin and motoxin shift the voltage dependent of dependence of activation to more hyperpolarized potentials. And it also shifted the voltage dependence of inactivation to depolarized potentials. So really this leads to um, a, a window current consistent with the increased neuronal excitability that we saw in both um, calcium imaging and also single fiber recording experiments. Now, anecdotally, um, dendronite moroides um, causes stings that are much more painful and longer lasting than those of dendronite excelsa. And consistent with those anecdotal reports, we actually found that Motox um, was significantly more potent than excelsitoxin. Um, so, um, and they inhibited inactivation of the voltage-gated sodium current with an EC50 of about four nanomolar 
for motoxin and about um, 60 nanomolar for excelsitoxin. And in comparison, you'll remember that I mentioned that the cl most closely related um, peptide is a, um, a, a plant peptide derived from the, from the P, um, PA1B. And PA1B in comparison had absolutely no activity at um, a concentration of 300 nanomolar. Uh, importantly, also, we saw that excelsitoxin um, acts ir virtually irreversibly on voltage-gated sodium channels. And so even with a 30-minute washout um, protocol, we could not um, reverse any of the effects. And this could perhaps provide an explanation for the long-lasting effects that we see in vivo. Now, in um, TE671 cells, the endogenous current is mediated by NAV 1.7 um, and so we confirmed this by CRISPR mediated knockdown um, of NAV 1.7 in these cells so on the right you can see that um, after knockdown um, you get a significant reduction in current and so this was uh, particularly interesting because NAV 1.7 is of course a very well-known pain target where loss of function mutations cause congenital insensitivity to pain and gain of function mutation mutations cause painful conditions like inherited erythromyalgia or paroxysmal extreme pain disorders. So um, we wondered whether um, NAV 1.7 might also mediate the in vivo effects of the GIMPI ties. And so to assess this, we um, again turned to our in vivo um, pain assay and we uh, quantified excelsitoxin induced pain behaviors after co-administration of um, the relatively non-selective uh, sodium channel blocker to trototoxin and also a selective NAV 1.7 inhibitor called PN3A, which was actually derived from um, spider venom. Uh, and so uh, what you can see on the right is that, again, excelsitoxin um, causes emergence of robust nose offensive um, behavior. So, if, uh, for example, poor licking uh, and flinching. And this is almost completely reversed after um, administration of both tetrodotoxin and also PN3A. And so these data really suggest that the populations of neurons activated by excelsitoxin almost certainly include classical nociceptors that are defined by expression of NAV 1.7. Uh, so in summary, um, hopefully I've shown you today that the gimpitides are a new class of plant-derived neurotoxic peptides. Uh, they activate NAF 1.7 expressing sensory nerve endings to cause pain and they do this by impairing inactivation of voltage-gated sodium channels and also by um, enhancing channel activation. The duration of symptoms in humans, which um, are particularly uh, prolonged, can perhaps be explained through the near irreversible modulation of sodium channels. Um, and the 3D structure of the gimpitides, as well as the pharmacology, is actually reminiscent of inhibitory cysteine, not peptides from animal venoms. Um, so in combination, hopefully, um, this makes a good case that the Australian stinging tree is perhaps um, a, a truly venomous plant. Um, and so I'll leave it at this uh, for today, and I'll just finish by acknowledging um, in particular Tom Durek and Ed Gilding from the University of Queensland, um, who've been instrumental um, in terms of uh, peptide chemistry, um, isolating the peptides and also the plant biology side, um, and also members um, of my group in particular, uh, Sina Jami, um, Jennifer Deuce, Tilla Israel, Sam Robinson, and also um, members um, of the Institute for Molecular Bioscience, including Jenny Stone, Jaron Brown. So thank you very much.